well known in Europe around the 1900s. How familiar were the West with the idea of what a geisha was? Um, I don't think people had a great deal of an idea. Um, it is one of these words that has somehow come into English because there's no equivalent in English at all. Um, and when Westerners first went to Japan, one of the first things they wanted to do was to see geisha. But nobody really knew what a geisha was. And, people um, thought they were courtesans, really, didn't they? Um, the reason why we have the word geisha in English is because there is no exact translation. What they were by 1900, which is, what, which is when Sadiako came, was kind of like celebrities. When I mean, you have a society, you have a world in which there's no TV, there's no movies, so people are going to the theater or they're going to geisha districts. And so some, a geisha, a top geisha, um, was rather like a kind of a rolling together of um, Kate Moss, Madonna, Gwyneth Paltrow. So, so very glamorous, in other words. Extremely glamorous, extremely famous, extremely celebrated. Sadiaka was the most famous geisha in Japan. How did she come to be, to have this sort of unique accolade? To be the most famous? Yeah, to be the most famous. Um, she was chosen by the Prime Minister, Hirobumi Ito, who um, had actually been in London and studied at University College London, went back to Japan, was Prime Minister four times over. He was also the first Prime Minister of Japan. So he was kind of like um, the George Washington of Japan, crossed with Bill Clinton because he had a bit of a twinkle in his eye. Um, <laughs> and he was, a good, he was good at spotting the most beautiful geisha of the whole lot. Um, Sadiako had been trained in things like, um, besides dancing and singing, which were geisha skills, she, had, uh, she was very good at billiards, she was good at horse riding, she could read and write. She was a very, very bright, intelligent, witty woman. Is it true that she was the geisha that inspired Puccini when he wrote Madame Butterfly? Um, he already had the story of Madame Butterfly, which was a short story by John Luther Long. But what he needed was an image of, um, an image of a Japanese woman that would fit the image that Westerners wanted. And Sadiako, being very canny, presented herself in that kind of way. So when she turned up in Paris, um, she came with a theatre troupe. They were the first theatre troupe to, to, to um, perform in the West. It was the first time that Westerners had heard Japanese music. And she was Japan's first actress, because before her, it had been um, male actors doing women's parts, as in, as in Kabuki. To what extent was being a geisha, to what extent did it rule your entire life? I mean, was it genuinely a way of life in every respect? The, the food you ate, obviously the clothes you wore, the way you carried yourself? Um, being a geisha was not so much a job as a calling, so it was your whole life. But once Sadiako um, became an actress, she ceased to be a geisha. Why? Because that was impure? You couldn't um, be an actress and a geisha at the same time? She, she'd given up being a geisha before that when she became a wife. You have two, two sorts of women in Japan, um, or you had two sorts of women in Japan. You had wives and you had geisha. And men could spend time with their wives or they could spend time with geisha. But you could not be a geisha and a wife. To what extent is geisha culture still alive in Japan today? Oh, it's quite alive. Um, it's actually rather popular. Quite a lot of girls are choosing to become geisha at this point. Um, in the sense of being expert in traditional Japanese music and dance. Um, not necessarily in, in any kind of sexual sense. But still, it's still quite uh, lively. There's, there, are, there are probably geisha districts in every city in Japan, I would say. Um, and I've been to quite a few of them and quite a few geisha parties. Well, well, Leslie Donner, thank you very much indeed for today.